All right, folks, we're going to get started. As much as we love our friends from planning, we're going to ask them to vacate. All right, we're back in session as Baltimore City Council Ways and Means Committee. We are here for City Council Ordinance 23-0381, fiscal year ending June 30th, 2024. We're here for the Mayor's Office of Employment Development. I'm Eric Costello, uh, Chair of the Committee. I'm about to pass the gavel over to Councilman Robert Stokes, 12th District, member of the Committee, Councilman Zeke Cohen, 1st District, Councilman John Bullock, 9th District. Uh, to my immediate right is Tony, staff to the committee. We have representatives from the Mayor's Office and the Council President's Office. Uh, Director Garvin, uh, make sure that all of your folks have the red light on when they're speaking. Uh, it's the button on the right uh, on your uh, little dashboard there. When you're done speaking, please be sure to take it off. Uh, you want to be about a hand's length away from the microphone when you're speaking. Um, director, if you could please introduce uh, the members of your senior team that are here to testify, first and last name and position title, and then run through your slide deck, and we'll take it from there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the council. My name is Matt Garvin, and I'm the acting director at the Mayor's Office of Employment Development. Um, I'm going to have my team say their names and titles. So it'll probably be quicker. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Craig Lewis. I'm the Assistant Director, Chief of Adult Services with MOED. Good afternoon. My name is Donnie Brown, Assistant Director, Chief of Youth Services with the Mayor's Office of Employment Development. Good afternoon. I'm Patty Morphy, the Director of Performance and Planning with the Mayor's Office of Employment Development. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh. We got technical difficulties. Good afternoon. My name is David Hagens. I'm the agency chief financial officer. And I think I think that's everyone. So if there's a couple of things I just want to say before I start the presentation. First of all, this is my second year of unexpectedly doing this presentation. But any time that I am able to talk about the work that we do at MOED, I'm excited to talk about it because I am very connected to the work. And I know that the folks on our team are very connected to the work, even if talking about it is maybe getting grilled in front of the council. I'm happy to do so. Um, Navigating things unexpectedly is something that I think is a really sh strong suit at MOED, especially going through a pandemic and continuing to be committed to our mission is really important to us. We are an economic justice agency. That's how we describe ourselves. That's how we hold ourselves out to be. This is our uh, economic justice statement here. Um, it's something that we worked really hard on with um, some consultants to come up with, and we embody that. We believe that we are fulfilling a mission, not just filling slots and working to build a more coordinated workforce system. So one of our goals for next year is actually to measure that coordination across the system and how that's advancing economic justice. And we are some really talented people on our staff, along with partners, have come up with a tool that we're rolling out now, and we hope to be able to talk about that more throughout the year. And then our second goal is around continuing to create strategies and implement strategies that um, connect with the people we serve, our residents and our employers. Um, one of the things, again, we are very mission driven, but the thing that I really love about MOED is the level of creativity and innovation that we have at our agency. You can see that throughout the pandemic with projects such as the Baltimore Health Corps Initiative. That was a project where we worked with the health department. We helped to get almost 300 people placed at the health department in the role of contact tracers at the time. No one really knew what that was. We did that all virtually. We got them connected to supportive services and also um, we got them connected with uh, training. And from the learnings from there, we were able to create the Higher Up initiative. Hopefully you saw on Sunday on the cover of the Baltimore Sun, Carlos, one of our participants talking about how much he valued that program. Others like Let's Ride to Work. So I know because of the dynamic team that we have at MOED, who to me really embody what it means to be public servants will continue to come up 
and scale and create new initiatives. The last thing that I want to say in terms of when I go through the slides, I just want to keep in mind during this time period that um, us and some of our partners we're still dealing with some of the operational impacts from the pandemic. So sometimes our centers would be open and then have to close. Sometimes we would be virtual or sometimes by appointment only. And that was us and also the partners that we work with. So I just want to keep that in mind as I go through the slides. So, so you know how long you need for your slide? The time? How much time? Excuse how me? much time you need? I'm going to breeze through them. I'm going to try to go through them as okay. fast as I can. Okay. I can talk fast, so I'll go fast. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> So our first slide, this is Service 791. This operates our Yo Academy, which is located in Westside Yo. Important thing to remember here that there's no city funding involved here. The output here is really the input, so we can only work with individuals who are referred to us. In this case, the actual is a little bit higher, that, again, based on referrals. And in terms of the transition plan, um, higher than the previous year, a transition plan that's post-secondary, so military, occupational training, um, college, et cetera, the 75% is high considering the, the population of individuals being served. Next slide is Service 792, Workforce Public Assistance. This is funding to support our Workforce Reception Center, WRC. It's located on 23rd in Maryland. Similar to the last slide, there's no city funding involved. This is a contract that we have with the state, the Department of Human, Re Human Services, um, we work with customers who are on temporary cash assistance, also known as temporary cash welfare. It's not open to the public, so we can only serve individuals that are referred to us. Important thing to remember here is that during this time period, a lot of benefits like SNAP, UI, at the state and federal level, they changed the rules. Same thing applied here. So individuals who are on TCA, any of the rules around um, having to do workforce search activities in order to receive the benefits, those were suspended for a good portion of this time. Higher than the previous year, but still um, because of those suspensions that impacted the unsubsidized work. Next slide. Um, this is Service 790. Three, funding to support our uh, community job hubs and some of our 21st century workforce services. Um, our community job hub model is such that we partner with a nonprofit community organization that we know has a good um, relationship in the community reputation, has traffic coming in. We embed an MOED staff person inside of that location and leverage that to offer our services to those customers coming in. During this time period, we had three, I would say, legacy hubs in operation, so GEDCO, Bond Secours, and My Brother's Keeper. Towards the end of the fiscal year, we brought on two more, so Waverly Library and also Our Daily Bread. Of course, anytime you start a new initiative, especially when you're partnering with an organization, it takes time to build that. So the actual is a little bit lower than the target, not far off but um, we'll continue to work on improving that and keep in mind what I said in terms of um, some of the operational challenges. And then again, in terms of the job attainment, much higher than it was in the previous year. Also keep in mind, we also have virtual services that have been introduced during the pandemic. We continue to explore ways that we can capture those. I know we met with some of our colleagues from the Maryland Workforce Association and other jurisdictions that are coming up with ways to capture our, those virtual services because we know our customers want to receive some services in that way. The next is our administration budget, so I'm just going to breeze through that. There's no measures there. The next, Service 795, this is funding to support our two comprehensive one-stop career centers. The output here actually is not solely based on us, it's also a partnership that we have with the state um, to offer UI benefits. So you actually don't want that number spiking up too high. If you look at FY20, clearly that is high. You don't want it to be too high there. And then in terms of the second bullet, um, and that, that signifies that a lot of people were on unemployment due to the pandemic. And that second bullet is um, exceeded the goal, and that's a, a WIO, a Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act measure. Oof, sorry about that. Our next service, 796, this is funding to support our Re-entry center, which is also known as the REC, is located inside our Northwest Career Center 
um, at Mandaman Mall. And this is funding to support individuals who are involved in the criminal justice system. In terms of the target here for employment assistance, this is really, really remarkable because as I stated, there were still those operational challenges and we know with this population being served, it already is very difficult in order to get them services. So having this number increase to that level is really because of the outreach and the dedication of the staff to reach this population. And also in terms of the, um, the employment obtained, we actually exceeded the goal here. So this is really remarkable. The next slide, Service 797, um, Workforce Services for Out-of-School Youth, our Youth Opportunity. We actually have two Youth Opportunity Centers. One is on the east side and one is on the west side. The east side center, we contract out to HEBCAC, and then on the west side center, um, we operate that center. Our manager is here, actually, Tavon Thomas. He's, thank you for joining us. Um, in terms of the actual, we took a little dip there, but some of the reasoning behind that is because some of the enrollments that were happening during the pandemic, those enrollments ended. And of course, during the pandemic, trying to get folks re-enrolled, um, that takes some time. And then we have a new manager in Tavon, and we also have basically all new staff at, um, at the Youth Opportunity Center, which we thought was really important because we want new, fresh ideas for Yo. There's never a good time to make big operational changes like that, but if there is any time to do it, it's um, you know when it's slow. So we know it will have some short-term impacts, but we're believing that the long-term benefits will be greater. Next is uh, 798, this is uh, Youth Works, our summer jobs program. This is uh, summer employment for young people ages 14 to 21. Very timely to talk about this for this year. Youth Works for this year is about a month away. So it's a five week program. It's gonna start July 10th and end on August 11th. Um, the interesting thing about Youth Works, when we look at these targets, the Youth Works year spans over multiple fiscal years. So we're actually talking about the summer of 2021, which is one year after the pandemic. So if you look at FY21, this year, what we were one of the few jurisdictions to even have a youth works program. We had a completely virtual program. So to get 5,000 youth placed was great. And then in the summer of 21, um, we had a hybrid program. And you can see there was a huge increase there. And then we're happy to say for this year, um, we're gonna be able to place seven, over 7,800 young people in jobs. So getting back up to those pre-pandemic levels, and you can see in terms of the employer, um, the employer, the employers value youth works very much. And I think this is the last slide. This is service 800, workforce services for WIOA funded youth. This is funding that we get um, through the federal government through the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. And um, we contract all of this money out. We put it all on the street with uh, um, WIOA um, providers, youth providers who work with uh, young adults ages 18 to 24. The actual is pretty close to what it was in the previous year. Again, working with this population, trying to get them on virtually, I'm still working through that. But in terms of the youth enrolled in educational or occupational training, that goal was met. And that is all the slides. Uh, thank you so much. Sure. Um, you should have been here when we had our other budget meetings. You went through that so fast. I, I guess we could go home at a reasonable time. Yeah. We should have made you last. <laughs> <laughs> I want to recognize that Councilman Conway. My question is, how was the youth centers pick? And I like to see what they contract, because whatever the youth center, what kind of service they supposed to provide, what are the outcomes? Um, one question is, how was those two youth centers pick? Because one of them in my district. And in terms of the youth opportunity center? How was that pick as an opportunity center? Because I know a friend of mine, Todd Scott, Yes, we rise. We go over to jail every time, talk to these young men. Those are the kind of groups that need the funding because they have that relationship with those young men when they come out, when they've been released. And I don't see that happening. So I wonder how was these, these two groups picked when you got organizations to me that's doing the work but can't f seem to f find no money for it. Sure, so in terms of how Eastside Yo is selected, we have an RFP process, and so we have an RFP and we have individuals who 
score the RFP, and that's ultimately how they're selected. And Dunnies, I don't know if you want to add anything else more to that. Real quick before you start, when was the RFP offered? Uh, the last RFP was just offered this spring of 2022. I mean, I'm sorry, spring of 2023. And we recently, uh, not recently, but we released that um, in late March, early April. And there were only two organizations that submitted uh, for that. But we shared the RFP in the newspaper as well as the extensive list that MOED has. It was also shared with our youth committee for them to share within their network. And how long uh, is the youth um, center's contract? For two years, so our next RFP won't come out again until 2025. Okay. But if you have people that you'd like us to add to our RFP list to receive it, we'd be happy to add them. I do, but um, I, will only, I only want to talk about We Rise because those young men that we can put them to through the path through open mayor's office employment development right away because when they come out, I'm going to use an example. Young man was incarcerated. He's now working at the Pendry for a whole year. He, he's happy. He got a job. And those kind of stories we should have more of. You know, so we need to make sure we partner with all the youth groups in the city because everybody don't have that access. So we got to make sure that y'all get the access because I can talk about we are us. We over in the Oliver community. We just graduated 43 young men, and they were smiling and happy because they went through their whole process, wanted to give them some opportunities, and they just graduated May the 31st. Those are other kind of organizations that we need to tap into to provide the resources for them because a lot of groups in this city, they do all the work, but they don't get the money. So we got to make sure that that money kind of spreads out a little more instead of keep giving it to the same people. I want to know what their contract is. I want to know what they supposed to do. Because I'm requesting those two groups, I want to see their contract and what are the results and what are the outcomes that they supposed to be doing with our young people. We have not done that enough and we'll find out what everybody need to be doing as far as our young people. Because a lot of times, and I'll say it, we keep giving money to groups. What are the outcomes Community need to see the contract and what the, what is their processes and what do they, what should they be doing and what do their contracts say? And a lot of times we don't have access to that. We only know they got the money and they got a youth group or youth center and that's all you find out. So this is going to be a request for me to find out those two youth centers. What is their outcomes and what? What do they contract saying? What kind of services they supposed to provide it? And there's a scale. Is there, I guess, east and west? So it don't matter. As long as they're west, you have one, one in East Baltimore. 101 West 23rd Street. I knew Gerald Grimes for a long time over there. I mean, Gerald Grimes did some great stuff. So I'm glad to see that is still there because that was a, a great space for people looking for employment, GD. Resume writing, I'm glad it's still there. Even uh, OED over on Edison Highway. So that's my request, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, Councilman Cohen. Hey, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Director Garvin, and your team. Um, I do want to say that I feel like you all really haven't missed a beat. You know, we have a, we had a transition. You became director of the agency, um, you know, and your predecessor had done a great job of building the foundation of this agency over many years, and we're happy for him that he went to go work for the governor, but um, really appreciate that you've been able to step into this role and just completely take it over. And I haven't seen any kind of uh, challenges in terms of transition or succession or anything like that. So um, just wanna appreciate that. Um, and also, you know, I, I do think we should all take a lot of pride in our youth works program. It really is one of the best in the country, I think, as far as the amount of young people that we put to work, the intentionality around the jobs that we provide. Um, I think it's something that Baltimore should really feel proud of. And I did read the Sun article about the higher up, about the young person that had been squeegeeing and then um, ended up employed uh, through higher up and 
the growth that he's made and you know kudos to him and to you all for supporting him um you know one thing i think that we as a city need to really start to think about is artificial intelligence and the role that it is going to have on our jobs here in baltimore um many entry-level jobs within the next decade or so will be eliminated. And so we need to be ahead of the curb. We need to be preparing our kids for the future economy. Um, we need to be really strate strategic and thoughtful and not just do the same thing over and over and over again. Um, you know, we have some real growth industries in this city when I think about um, te tech and sort of where Baltimore is geographically positioned in relationship to Washington, D.C. and um, the, the whole SL Express. Um, we are a port city and robots will be able to do some jobs on the port, but not all of them. And transportation logistics remains a driving economic force in our city. And then, of course, eds and meds and our second to none hospital system um, here in Baltimore. And so I'm curious how we are thinking about uh, positioning our young people to be successful, not just in the current economy, but in an economy that is coming soon. And I think will look very, very different from the one that currently exists. Well, just to respond to some of the compliments that you gave. I appreciate you saying those things. And I do think the transition has been easy for me primarily because obviously of the work that Jason has, the foundation that he's laid, but also because of the people that we have at MOED. I think there's a lot said about vacancies, but there's a lot to be said about the people that are here, especially the staff that are here and the populations that we serve and how challenging it can be and how much people put their heart and soul and crea creativity to solve many of the city's challenges. So that's why it's easy for me to, to continue to work at MOED. Um, in terms of what you said about our youth work program, we do have one of the best youth works programs in the country. Comparatively to other cities, we're serving about 10% of the eligible population while cities that are much larger like New York are maybe only serving two. Mm -hmm. And we offer a lot of choice. Um, we have about 450 work sites and we allow our young people <coughs> to be able to choose where they work. So our youth works program is really excellent. In terms of thinking about um, AI in the future, these are conversations that are percolating, percolating up at different tables, so we'll continue to follow that. In terms of you know, thinking about um, preparing uh, young people for the jobs of the future, I know that we, we have a partnership right now with uh, city schools um, for the career counseling with Blueprint, and so we're working diligently on that. I know Donnie's just came from a meeting on that, and so as we think about the roles of the career counselors in school, we'll continue to think about um, future industries and what sort of things they should be talking with young people about, in including AI and other things like that. No, I appreciate that. And I would say that I think um, the Port of Baltimore offers some real opportunities for our young people. It always pains me when I go there and see a workforce that is not reflective of the city, um, that is uh, a lot of folks from the surrounding suburbs as well as Virginia and Pennsylvania. Um, and these are great jobs and they don't require a college degree necessarily. It's like the last, in my mind, real kind of blue collar job you can get where you can make six figures and do really well for yourself and I think um, I think this is just a comment generally is like, I do think that we need to better position ourselves in relationship to industry, um, thinking about development, you know, let's not have someone else come build our city for us. Let's build Baltimore ourselves. Like we should be, Moed should be in the room when developers are making big deals, right? Like we should... Um, you know, as we're thinking, as my colleague is really interested in reducing vacancies across our city and eliminating blight and uh, vacant houses, we should be putting Baltimoreans to work 
to do that work and not just through subcontracts. So I guess where I would just push us is to be more intentional in our relationships with folks in some of the prevailing industries that are gonna drive our economy, as well as our friends in organized labor. Um, because again, we still see really good union jobs in this city, um, but we have to be, I think the city government can be more intentional in convening and bringing folks to the table. I 100% agree. I think when we talk about our role as an economic justice agency, it's more than just saying, hey, we're just gonna put this person into this job, but really looking at industries at a whole, as a whole, when we're thinking about what are those barriers that are keeping people from accessing those industries, and we're working with our board talking about these things. And so our board is also working on adopting their own economic justice statement and some of these goals around, you know, how do we get people into industries where maybe they have been disadvantaged in the past. So, so we agree with that as well. Um, in terms of, what was your, excuse me, what was your second question that you said? Was it about No, I mean, that was it. It was, I, just, I, I think that we all, including members of this council, can be better about when there is a big development deal in our district that's about to go down, making sure you all are in the room, making sure we're just convening in a way that we're setting standards for developers and partnering with them to make sure Baltimoreans get the work and get the work at a union wage. And I think too often uh, there's subcontracting and wage theft and um, a whole lot of issues, but I, I just, I feel like MOED can really be an effective, and all of us can, but you all can be an effective convener um, so that Baltimore, Baltimoreans are building Baltimore, not just folks who you know, see, see an opportunity for profit in our city. Um, we should be at the table. Yes, I agree. And I think you know, one of the things that we're doing is we're a part of the uh, wind industry. We're working on getting someone hired on to be a part of those conversations mm -hmm. and building out that industry. Um, in addition, I think we have some, some examples in the past where we've worked on big development projects, such as Port Covington, sure. to help them build out all of their local hiring work. We have a local hiring person that is embedded in with the Port Covington staff, and so um, Baltimore Peninsula now. So we would love to continue to be a part of those conversations when big developments come to, come to Baltimore City. I appreciate that, and I'll just say there was a Big one in our district, uh, Harbor Point, asked for some additional zoning, and one of the uh, requirements that we asked of the developer was to do 30% local hire. Um, and honestly, it was a back and forth. Like, he was not with it initially, but he got there, and it's because we held the line and uh, made sure that it was clear that, you know, we want to see growth, we want to see investment, we want to see uh, more development happen in our communities, but Baltimoreans themselves, particularly those who have been least well served by the economic boom we're starting to see, need to be at the table and need to benefit and prosper from the work. So again, I, I appreciate your leadership and I uh, really appreciate MOED and the work that all of you do. Thank you. I just want to recognize uh, Councilwoman Odette Ramos, and I just have a qu question with um, um, Councilman Cohen. I actually went down to Port too, a long time ago, when we was talking about squeegee back then. And I'm saying they want to wash cars, maybe they can drive them off there. But that's a whole different issue with their homeland security. But I believe from the conversation I had with the Port, we need to have a better relationship with them, really, because what councilman said, we don't, the relationship is there, but we, it need to be a lot better. There are a lot of opportunities down there for young people down there. I also want to mention, I had two young ladies, African-American ladies came to me two weeks ago, wanted to learn about construction, and this is the real story. I sent it to a developer. They, was, they were gonna shadow them. Developer hired both of them. So they're going to learn the insides and the outside of construction. That's what we're talking about. 
he actually didn't have to pay them, but he, they were so interested, he actually hired them. They just called him today. They are happy. So this is the stories that we need to do more here in the city. Councilman Cohen. Councilman Conway. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Admittedly, our names sound similar. <laughs> um, Director Garvin, really good to see you. I, I appreciate all the work that you and your team do, and especially your ability to swoop in and keep the ship moving forward. Um, you know, it means a lot, I think, especially given the importance of the work you guys do. Um, I wanted to first start off with, I'm excited that uh, I'll be having two youth workers um, this summer and uh, really looking forward to working with the young people and um, hopefully, you know, maybe one of them will run for office one day, we'll see. Um, uh, I, I'm really curious um, from your perspective what you think are some of the ways that we can either further incentivize or further encourage young people to break into the job market. Um, I, of course, of course, our youth works program is um, one of the best and um, has had significant returns. But what do you think are some other things that uh, we can, should, or are already perhaps doing that um, you know would really help young people get into the job market? I definitely think that you know summer youth employment has been studied and evaluated plenty, and we know that that. Um, helps people get interested in work, it helps with academics, it helps with public safety. So um, continuing to make sure that we have work sites and that young people have a place to work in the summer is gonna be really important. And then also um, connecting with young people early. Again, referencing back to what we're doing with um, Baltimore City Public Schools, also in um, partnership with BCCC through the, the Kerwin legislation and getting the career counselors in schools, some in high schools, some in middle schools, and starting them early thinking about um, career opportunities, um, taking them to job fairs, having them do shadowing. We're in the process literally right now of building that out to get that started in the next fiscal that, year. That's great. Um, I, I think one of the other components to that is um, traditional, the traditional school route is not always gonna work the best for every, for every child. And I'm curious in the considerations for our approach, how are we making sure that we capture those folks that maybe are not considering college or maybe don't even finish high school and um, still want to have a family supporting job one day? How are we thinking about those pieces? <clears throat> yes, we actually have a program. We are we partner with Baltimore's Promise. It's called Grads to Careers, and so we we specifically do that. Um, we work with the schools to identify young people um, who know that they're not going to go to college, and then we get them connected to occupational training. That's great. Um, uh, and then uh, lastly, uh, I noticed that um, there's an additional five hundred thousand uh, dollars in unallocated state appropriations. Uh, in the budget. Um, can you talk a little bit about what that pot of money is for? Is that for new programming, existing programming, or a mixture of both? So there's an existing program that started in 2016. It's called the uh, District Court Reentry Program. It was started by Judge Nicole Pastore. There, there wasn't any funding connected to it, but I think to date, I think 195 people have graduated through this program, and it's basically an alternative. Instead of being incarcerated, there's an opportunity for those individuals to go into training. And she was able to, she's really dynamic and great, and she was able to secure funding from the General Assembly. That's going to pass through us. However, we're working in partnership with her. So this last year, we had a state-funded ARPA person. I don't think they've ever had a person funded through us to help um, with some case management and connect them back into the re-entry center. So right now, Craig and I are literally working on that budget with her. She's done great with the programming. We're just sort of adding in the extra sort of official programming the way that we do with MOED, helping them to get staff and then um, she'll run the program, but the staff will be MOED staff and connecting into our folks at the reentry center. Got it. That's great. And um, you said it, there were 190 something people who've gone through the program during what time span was that? So I think she started the program in 2016. So from 2016 to 2022, I think mm -hmm. we just got involved last year. Um, 195 people have gone through that and avoided um, being incarcerated. That's awesome. 
Um, looking forward to um, how the program works out and uh, if the additional capacity you know, help, can help make a difference in people's lives. So appreciate the work you do and if there's anything I can do to help you. Thank you. Um, director, I talked to Judge Pastore about that program. I think it's great. but We need money for kids. Don't wait till they get in trouble. That money is only for young people so they, if they become going into the criminal or uh, incarceration, that's what the money for. We need money, that's good. But what about the kids that are not in trouble or don't go down that path? And I said this to Judge Pastore, I'm like, that's great, but you know what she said? Well, we not get no kids because at that time, the state's attorney wasn't arresting nobody, okay? So nobody's coming through the court. So why the state keep giving money to people to wait till somebody get arrested and then you give them the money? My question is, where is the money for the kids that don't go down that path? So my suggestion to you, Director, maybe, and I can talk to Judge Pastore myself, but the General Assembly is saying we need some money on the other end too. It can't be always wait till young people Oh, well, here's your alternative. You got to take this or you're going to have a criminal record or arrest record. The state, if you're not, if the past state's attorney was not arresting nobody, that's exactly what she said out of my mouth, nobody's coming through the courts. So the state can't keep putting stipulations on money until you become or get may be arrested for something. So there should be some other money on the other end to help those young people that don't go that direction. So it's, it's just a suggestion, but it's a great program. Actually, they graduate across the street. I've been to a cop, um, couple of graduations. It's a great program, but I think there should be some balance there also for those kids that don't go down that path. Any other questions? If not, thank you, Director. I think you in that position because you should be there. You learned from Jason, he was great. So you learn all the ins and out, and you got a great staff, and y'all keep doing what you're doing. And this will be recessed, and we'll be starting the Department of General Service at 4 p.m. Thank you so much.